Good morning. Thank you, General Dean. It's my great pleasure and honor to uh, be part of this addiction uh, forum. My job is over the next 10 minutes to give you a sense of uh, the uh, evidence base for, uh, for prevention. Uh, so in case I get uh, cut off, I understand uh, General Dean is going to keep a close track of time. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, in the words of Dr. Chandler, I think we do have a, a pretty robust uh, evidence base uh, at, uh, at this uh, point. We know much more than we did uh, 25 years ago when I started in this field. So uh, the first, um, so I have five takeaways. I've boiled down the last 25 years of research to, on uh, prevention to uh, five takeaways. And the first one uh, you heard a little bit about from Dr. Chandler, and that is the importance of starting young. And so as Dr. Chandler said, um, we know that uh, substance use starts young. It starts uh, often in the teen years. And uh, this is a really a change from 25 years ago where we uh, focused on uh, the ages of uh, uh, high school students and sometimes middle school students. We've learned to start even earlier. So some examples, uh, the average age uh, of initiation for alcohol use is 17 years. Uh, Average means many start younger than that. The average age for cigarettes is now 18, according to 2013 national data. Marijuana is also 18, so we're at the same point with marijuana and uh, tobacco initiation. Uh, prescription drug uh, initiation, the average age is a little bit older. It's 22, but I think we're going to start seeing that come down to younger ages. So not only is it important to start young because that's when substance use starts, but even more importantly, risk and protective factors are in place prior to initiation, and it's important to change those factors before they become uh, deeply ingrained. Um, so uh, uh, focus on modifiable risk and protective factors is my second point. So you heard a little bit about that from Dr. Chandler, and I just want to make two points about that. The first point is the emphasis on modifiable. So some risk and protective factors are mo modifiable and others are not. Your genetic makeup is typically not a modifiable risk factor, but we know a lot about what the modifiable risk factors are, and so evidence-based prevention uh, focuses on those uh, risk and protective factors. And as you heard from Dr. Chandler, and how about that? Start young. risk and protective factors. And so as you heard from Dr. Chandler, these risk and protective factors exist at the individual level, the family level, the school level, and the community level. So just a quick example at each level, uh, at the individual level, having friends who use drugs is uh, a peer a risk factor. Uh, Parental uh, laxness, favorable parental attitudes and practices in relation to substance use is a family level risk factor. Uh, disengagement from school is a school level risk factor. And then uh, high levels of availability of uh, alcohol, tobacco, and drugs is a community level risk factor. So let's hone in a little bit on the community level risk factors. So uh, this is just to give you a sense of uh, the traction we've been able to achieve trying to address community-level risk factors uh, through evidence-based strategies, what now are uh, considered evidence-based strategies. So in the far right column, you'll see the scientific evidence, and I've chosen strategies that are supported by uh, the Community Preventive Services Task Force. And the reason for that is it's a very systematic review process that uh, the task force goes through. It's sponsored by CDC, but it's uh, independent from CDC. And, um, and so these are uh, strategies that have been shown in multiple studies to affect these risk factors and ultimately have uh, positive outcomes in relation to substance use. So you can read those. I won't go through each one of them in the interests of time, but uh, we've seen uh, um, uh, strategies like increased enforcement of laws prohibiting sales to minors of alcohol and tobacco, uh, uh, increases in alcohol taxes, increases in uh, the price of tobacco uh, 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 products, 
and uh, restricting outlet density for alcohol uh, all having positive uh, impact. So number three. So number three, I think uh, what we've learned from 25 years of experience is use a comprehensive approach. And I want to make an important distinction there. So why use a comprehensive approach? Well, substance use in communities is the result of multiple risk factors at multiple levels. We just talked about that, the individual, family, school, and community level. And so it's important to address factors at all of those levels. Um, it's uh, substance abuse in a community, substance use in a community, is not the outcome, not the result of a single factor. And in fact, the community-based models that have demonstrated success focus on multiple risk factors. And so uh, these are things like uh, communities that care, uh, communities mobilizing for change on alcohol. Uh, the community trials project have had uh, positive impacts on alcohol, tobacco, and, um, and, um, and these are rigorous trials funded by the NIH, NIAAA, and uh, NIDA. But then, as we heard earlier, uh, evaluation data from the Drug-Free Communities Program uh, also has shown positive uh, impact of this uh, multifaceted community-based approach that targets uh, risk factors at the community level. And you heard from Dr. Chandler that those effects are, uh, have been demonstrated for alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. The reason I bring up that example is it's not a randomized trial like the other, uh, uh, the other initiatives that I uh, mentioned, but it really is an example of taking this approach to scale. You heard earlier from Dr. Chandler that uh, there are currently 680 uh, drug-free uh, community-funded coalitions and a total of 2,000 out there. So that's sort of taking this to scale par excellence. And finally, the selection of strategies should reflect local conditions. So when I say comprehensive, it's not, it doesn't mean throw the kitchen sink at the problem in local communities. It's really important to uh, assess what the local conditions are, what the local risk and protective factors are, and address those in a way that's specific to that community. So just as a quick example, in terms of underage uh, alcohol use and high-risk alcohol use, in a college community, you may have a cluster of alcohol outlets surrounding the campus and high alcohol, high alcohol outlet density, uh, a lot of uh, drink promotions, two-for-one promotions, a lot of advertising. That's very enticing, not just to college students, but to high school students as well. I was recently at the flagship uh, campus of a state university, and the word there is that uh, in their entertainment district, uh, that's um, where the college students go to drink, if you can see over the bar counter, you'll get served. You'll get, uh, you'll get served a drink. Um, so that's a very different set of local conditions and risk factors than a community where there aren't alcohol outlets, a lot of alcohol outlets. They do a good job of, ch of doing age identification, but kids are getting their alcohol at uh, parties, parties that are either hosted by parents or uh, tolerated uh, 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 by parents. Okay, so number four. Uh, Action at the federal, state, and local level is needed. So my example of this is the 21-year-old drinking age. So real quickly, the 21-year-old drinking age is one of the great success stories in public health in the 20th century. You heard earlier uh, from um, uh, one of the earlier speakers about the dramatic reductions in tobacco use, but also alcohol use over uh, the past 20, 25 years. And uh, if, you look at this, uh, if you look at this graph, you can see that this also has had a dramatic impact on alcohol-related uh, fatal traffic crashes, so a really important outcome. And so um, you can see that there's been a dramatic reduction, a 77% reduction in alcohol-related fatalities uh, from uh, uh, traffic crashes during that, uh, during that period. So, how is that an example of action at all levels? So,
you had federal legislation uh, in uh, 1984 that created incentives for those states that did not have a 21-year-old drinking age to pass a 21-year-old drinking age. And specifically, this it was tied to highway funding, highway construction. So that was uh, very effective. So over the course of uh, between 1984 and 1988, all 26 states that did not have a 21-year-old drinking age passed a 21-year-old drinking age. So the federal legislation uh, uh, was a spark, was a catalyst for uh, a state enactment of state laws setting 21 as the minimum legal drinking age. But then importantly, local activities have been critical in, uh, in uh, making sure that the 21-year-old drinking age actually works at the local level. So that includes law enforcement, especially law enforcement around sales to underage people. Uh, and uh, providing alcohol to underage people. It includes education campaigns uh, run by community coalitions and others at the local level, and local policy as, uh, as well. So um, in many ways, to paraphrase uh, a former uh, speaker of the House, all who said all politics is local, all prevention is local, or much prevention is local. The, state, the feds and the state can create a framework, but it's critical to see these local activities take place in, a, in, a, in an effective manner. So uh, number five is uh, take it to scale. And I actually think this is one of our biggest challenges. We know a lot now about how to do sub effective substance abuse prevention. But how do we get it from a handful of research studies to out there to uh, hundreds or thousands of local communities? That's really, I think, the challenge that we have in this field uh, right now is the challenge of translation. It's the challenge that we face in many, many other areas of public health and medicine as well, translating research findings into practice in a way that will actually affect um, um, outcomes at the population level. So I would argue that the community-based strategies, the environmental strategies, have some inherent advantages over individual level and family level strategies. I think they're all important. We have to do all of them. But it's sort of like the difference between working at a retail level and a wholesale level. And so it's important not to, it's, it's daunting to try to think about changing the hearts and minds of youth by educating them or counseling them one by one. So if we can do something that changes the contingencies in their environment, that's a, uh, I, I, I think we get a lot of bang for their buck. And they complement each other, uh, the, um, the community level strategies, the environmental strategies, and the individual level strategies. Uh, the second issue, I think, in bringing it to scale is this idea of creating a prevention infrastructure. So at the state level, uh, we know that the single state agencies and other state organizations play an important role in providing uh, technical assistance and training, uh, and in some cases funding to local communities to uh, implement these uh, evidence-based practices. Uh, but we also know that we need boots on the ground. We need activity going on in local, and it's often uh, in the form of local coalitions, that can assess the local community, that can select evidence-based strategies and implement those strategies and hopefully evaluate those strategies. Sure. So I think our best example of this approach is tobacco control. So uh, it's hard to see, but admire the shape of that curve. That is a beautiful curve, right? Because what we saw was per capita tobacco use rising dramatically throughout uh, the first part of the 20th century until 1964. And then in 1964, the Surgeon General's report came out uh, establishing and, and uh, making widespread uh, the, the idea, the understanding that uh, of the health uh, risks of smoking. And that led to a cascade of, uh, of action at multiple levels targeting everything from the community to individuals. So bans on ads on radio and TV, increases in price, um, uh, availability, so 18-year-old uh, minimum age, local enforcement of the minimum age, 
et cetera. So I think this is really our best example. So uh, again, uh, these are, uh, I think, the takeaways from the last 25 years of about what we've learned. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you.